Hey Stockholm, hello Stockholm. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about something that's actually pretty boring uh, in most people's mind, uh, which is a CDN. Uh, Arthur Bergman, uh, long history of doing open source development uh, and uh, various large websites for history. Uh, and I'm actually from Stockholm. Uh, I was just commenting, it's pretty funny. People speak English to me, I reply in Swedish and people keep speaking English to me. Uh, so, after 13 years of not living here, I now realize how hard it must be to learn Swedish. Um, so, my, the story really start, started in 2008 when I was at Wikia, where uh, I decided uh, somewhat foolishly that we needed to build our own CDN. Um, in retrospect, not that foolish. And I took two servers to check luggage and flew from San Francisco to London and built our first pop. Right? That is a very cost effective way of moving servers between countries. Um, not recommended. Uh, and uh, in 2011, started Fastly, you're five years old, headquarters in San Francisco, uh, 270 employees. And why, why a CDN? So if you have an HTTP request, my goal here is really to convince you that if you have an HTTP request going over the internet and you're not using a CDN, then either you are doing something wrong, or we are not providing you the service that, you sh that we should, and you can't use us. Because right? I firmly believe that if you're sending an HTTP request over the internet, it should be using a CDN. I'll go through why. So, how many people here actively use CDNs? Like, so, well, not that many. How many programmatically interface with your CDNs and so on? Uh, that is depressingly few. Uh, to most people, this is what a CDN is. Right? It's a big black box that sits somewhere between your servers and the end users and supposedly makes things faster. But you don't actually know what it does, how it works, um, where your traffic is going. This is one big black box, right? kind of like magic, which is just a meaning that you don't actually understand what's going on, so it looks like magic to you. It's not actually magic. It's very, very simple. It's a reverse proxy, right? We all know what reverse proxies are, right? Like, we use them, we use ELBs, we use F5s, which are terrible. We use HA proxies, squid, whatever we use, we use a reverse proxies all the time, right? They terminate our HTTP requests and they send traffic to our app servers. It's pretty standard architecture to have them involved, right? The only difference between a CDN and a reverse proxy is that we have them all around the world. That is really the only difference, right? So if your client is in Tokyo, they go to a reverse proxy in Tokyo that then sends the request onwards to your app server in EC2 East. But at fundamentally, all it is, it's a reverse proxy. It's also a reverse proxy with a big, awesome amount of caching attached to it, uh, which is, is, is key, and I'll get into that later. So this reverse proxy has to run on something. Um, what it runs on for us uh, is pretty powerful machines. Uh, I heard the previous presenter talk about the loss of virtualization. Uh, we don't virtualize because the loss of performance is just too, too bad. But it's kind of amazing, right? Like one rack, we can put 768 terabytes of SSDs. Right? Like it is an enormous amount of storage that we can deploy in a fairly small um, footprint at the edge and a lot of bandwidth that we then give um, access to everyone for. So what happens when you use a CDN? You have a user. The user goes to a DNS server. The DNS server tells the user, go to a CDN pop. Typically you have C named or somehow delegated that responsibility to CDN. CDN pop gets the request. If the CDN pop doesn't have the request, it goes back to origin. And origin responds with the object. And we store it in the cache, and then we return it to the user. It's very, very simple. 
And if they cache it, you don't actually have to go back to the origin. Basically, we're all used to using memcache, Redis, or whatever caching technology we use inside our own data center. But the CDN is, is really the same thing, but outside and in a pass-through matter, right? So you don't give us content. When the user requests it, we, on demand, lazily fill up uh, with what, con what the user is requesting. And we're close to the user. So then, you know, the standard complaint I hear is, my content is private, it's so special, like, it's only served to one user, um, there's no way we can cache it, it has PII, blah, 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 blah. That's not usually true. Uh, when you actually think about it, most of your content is, depending on your application, but most of it is actually shareable, right? It's just that typically you have really bad architectures that mix and match the private and non-private data into one payload, and that makes it hard. So why should you care, right? Traditional CDNs have been owned by the operations people it's been something you add on, bolt on later, and typically they just make your life harder, right? They intercept your request, they cache, they do weird things to them. And as developers, and this is certainly me, before I started a CDN, um, I actually always hated using one. Like I knew it was an evil I had to deal with, but not a, something that actually helped me. So why should you care? So the first reason is performance. Right? We all like performance. Uh, this is a very uh, simple chart of what happens to your bounce rate. It's actually taken from Wikia when I was there. Um, to your bounce rate when, when site performance goes down. Right? So the jump from 0.3 uh, second load time to two seconds is 7.5 to 20% bounce rate. Like That's pretty damn huge. And it's actually very early in the in the... Uh, chart that you get most of the effect. So why are things slow? It's latency. Uh, latency is a measure of time delay experienced in a system. The precise definition of it depends on the system and the time being measured or waiting for shit. Right? And latency adds up. So when you have something latency here and you have some latency here and you have, you have to add it all up and you get something really bad. Fundamentally though, what CDNs help you with is a latency that you can't solve otherwise, which is this. Which is speed of light. Right? No matter how hard you try, it's going to take, give or take, 200 milliseconds for something from Europe to reach Australia. Now, it's two-thirds of that in fiber, plus fiber doesn't actually follow the, the shortest path. So, no matter how, fa how clever your code is, no matter what you're doing, fundamentally, you have to deal with that difference. So, you cache it locally. The second is security. So we all want our sites to be secure. What is this? This is 160 gigabit per second DDoS. Uh, it happened very, very quickly. So you can see the normal traffic starting up in the morning, going, then increasing traffic, which was someone probing the network. And then within two, three minutes, it goes from 20 gigs inbound to 160 gigabits per second inbound. Right? And this is actually a pretty small attack. CDNs, implicitly, because you send all your traffic through them, protect you against that. Right? Like, and the only way to fight the DDoS is to have more capacity than your attacker. So we provide layer 3 for DDoS protection, layer 7 protection. You can put in blocks. You can analyze your traffic at the edge. Uh, and then you can put in rules for what you want to block, what you don't want to block, what you want to um, tar pit, and so on. And the edge is important, because if you look at, like, this is a normal traffic distribution for us. Uh, you can see that there is, uh, there's a fair amount of bandwidth going between Ashburn, San Jose, uh, Ashburn, Virginia, San Jose, and Amsterdam, which are our largest data centers. And then there isn't actually that much traffic going long distance, because our entire purpose in life is to serve users that are close. And then this happens. Um, so having been DDoSed a lot, 95% from them are from China. And I wish they would just shut the firewall off uh, and not actually send us any more traffic. Uh, because all of that was China. Right? And what's really frustrating with it is that they have this giant firewall, so they know it's happening. Right? They inspect every single fucking packet going over the wire. 
and yet they're okay letting like 200 million packets per second leave the country, not enter. So our ability to absorb that at the edge, far from where your data center is, far from where your cloud provider is, um, is really powerful because it's the only way to have enough capacity um, to handle it. It's also the only way to help our ISPs handle it because they don't actually have enough capacity to backhaul everything to a certain region. Right? So like you will actually see saturation at multiple levels of the internet. So the largest attack we've seen was about 200 million sin sins per second and over 400 gigabits per second. Um, how many people here have been DDoSed? Too many, I'm sorry. One of the things that's, for me, that's hardest with DDoS, and it's the outsource your emotional burden, when you have an outage, when you deploy a bug, when you do something wrong, like you made a mistake, right? You can write, you can do a postmortem, you can figure out what went wrong, and you can fix it. Um, if a DDoS, there's actually an asshole sitting somewhere else in the world making your life miserable. And that's a huge difference from like, the emotional burden uh, of having to deal with that outage because you're trying to fix something and you change a rule and then this asshole or group of assholes discovered you changed it and they attack you again. And it, it's really, really quite uh, tiring when you're dealing with that day in and day out. The other is if it's actually cached. If we can cache a page on the CDN, it doesn't actually matter if they're DDoSing it. Like if they want to fetch a page half a million times a second, like go for it. This is coming straight out of like level three cache. You know, it's not actually hard. Final one is availability. So here's another chart, which looks very much like a DDoS, right? So it goes from one, this is multiple services, but one customer. Um, goes from about 10,000 requests per second to peaks close to 60,000 requests per second in less than 15 minutes. What this actually was was Prince died, right? And this is a new, large new sites traffic. Um, and what you see is going from a total of about 16,000 RPS to 140,000 RPS. This is one of the things where DDoSs are really hard to auto block because this looks exactly like a DDoS. Suddenly there's like millions of new clients all across the world hitting the site in a very, very short fashion. They cached everything, so their origins so no increasing traffic. Right? Like everything was handled at the edge, they never even noticed. And you can't auto scale that. Right? Like you don't have enough time to auto scale up in response for an event like that, and you have no way of predicting that event. Right? So if you we do a lot of Super Bowl traffic that you can auto that you can scale up ahead for. Something like this, you just can't. And so if you have to compute the page and deliver it, it's game over. If you can store it in cache and deliver it instantly, like 140,000 requests per second is actually not that much. We also support two really cool features. One actually browser support, which is stale while revalidate, uh, but also stale if error. So if your origin goes down, we keep serving whatever traffic we have. Uh, or whatever content we have. So if you have an outage, the CDN has the content, no one should ever notice. Uh, we, we had a customer email us in once and said, um, I, took down, <laughs> I took down our data center and the site is still working, can you explain how? And I was like, yeah, it's because things work like they should. Um, availability wise also, we have, you know, we have many ISPs, all CDNs have many ISPs. These are the ones that we use. And we can actively route around problems. So Telia, for example, right now is running on like 40% capacity in Sweden of what they normally should. Um, so we can stop using them. We can route around them. Uh, and we also route between our own pops continuously uh, which path we think is best. So if you can do things uh, at the edge, you beat the speed of life uh, and you can defend uh, against attacks, DDoSs, and other security attacks as well. So that's kind of fundamentally why I think that if you're sending an HTTP request over the internet and it's not going over a CDN, it's not a very valuable HTTP request. Like, it should be going over a CDN if it has any value whatsoever. So you use this all the time. 
um, all of your all your build systems use us at least. You also use all the sites, uh, but uh, we support a lot of open source uh, projects. So if you install any of these package libraries, that's actually coming from Fastly. Um, and if any of one of you are running an open source project, um, we are always uh, open to sponsoring them. It's, it's one of the few ways we feel that we can really easily give back. Um, developer tools. Uh, whenever you use GitHub, uh, for example, um, New Relic, uh, all of that traffic is coming through us. Again, New Relic is actually a really interesting use case because for one of the things they use us for is uh, their mobile SDK. So when a mobile SDK reports performance metrics back to, back to New Relic, it actually goes via Fastly. That is not a typical CDN use case at all. Right? There's no caching involved. All it is, is it allows the phone, it allows the client to negotiate a handshake much closer and then lets them use very long running connections to us, from us to them, so they don't have to maintain a huge TLS infrastructure. They also get a nice speed performance. So even if your content isn't cacheable, there is something called dynamic site exploration. And uh, it actually does work. The reason it works is this. When you open a new connection, you send a SYN. You get a SYN act back. So let's say you're 100 milliseconds each way from the server. You now spend 200 milliseconds opening the CCP connections. You then send the TLS handshake. And you get a TLS handshake back. So that's another 200 milliseconds. You then send your request. And you start getting your res response back. So you're up to 600 milliseconds before you're starting getting any data back, assuming the server responds immediately, of course. And you're starting from a very, very uh, slow TCP connection, because you start with an uh, initial congestion window of 10. And it will take a while, well, 200 milliseconds for, per round trip for it to start uh, opening up so you can actually deliver bandwidth at a high speed. So what if you have a CDN? Like, this content is not cacheable. Like, there's no way we can store it. Um, that entire sequence happens to a CDN node that's, let's say, 20 milliseconds away. And then the CDN forwards the request back to origin. But that is already a pre-existing connection that's usually already very open. So you get a total transaction time of 320 milliseconds until you get the first byte back. And you will typically get it back at a much higher rate because the actual negotiation for the congestion window based on round trip actually only happens between the client and the CDN node, which is only 20 milliseconds apart. So the, window, the bandwidth um, throughput will go up much, much faster. All right, so even if there's no cacheable content, you will see a significant performance improvement just by sending the traffic through a CDN, for a reverse proxy close to the user. And you can go in on Sedexis and look at their DSA numbers. They actually show the difference between a going directly to origin and going through a CDN. And so uh, Brazil, uh, Brazil to, to the US, the difference is roughly like 600 milliseconds between having to go directly and going through the CDN. A lot, of, a lot of content, though, is actually cacheable. Right? So when I started Fastly, I was at Wikia. And if you think of a wiki page, uh, they don't actually change very often. Right? So we have like 200 million wiki pages. We get X number of edits per day. Once a topic isn't active anymore, it usually doesn't get an edit until it becomes active. So going back to origin and re-rendering each of those pages doesn't make sense. Caching them close to the user is problematic if you risk having stale data. Because if a user hits edit, saves, and it doesn't reflect that, they get really up, uh, upset. Right? If you think of an e-commerce solution, like inventory data and price data seems like it can change, you know, can't be cacheable. But that's only if you can't actually invalidate it. Right? Like it's actually cacheable because it only changes when a trigger forces it to change. That's true for a lot of uh, pieces of content out there, especially when we're seeing the trend, right, is that people are rewriting their apps to be API-driven, both progressive web apps from their cell, from their mobile apps, 
uh, they're splitting up the uh, private and personal API calls. And so the personal API calls, uh, the, sorry, the public API calls versus the private ones, the public ones become very easy to cache. Um, so we have some pretty awesome features that help you with this. Uh, and it's all about real time, right? Because if you want to be able to use the CDN for that kind of content, you have to trust it to actually allow you to deal with that content. So to actually invalidate, uh, if anyone's ever dealt with the, the horrible thing that AWS CloudFront's invalidation is, uh, this is how easy it is to validate on Fastly. Right? All you send is a purge, the purge uh, HTTP verb to Fastly, and then typically you will have an ACL um, or API key, and the content is gone. It's 150 milliseconds to get rid uh, all around the world, which is basically network latency one way uh, for the messages to distribute. And once you have that, there's so much more you can cache, right? Like what you thought you couldn't cache, because you now have the same control on your internal, on your external cache as your internal, right? We also support surrogate key tag um, purging, so you can tag HTTP responses. So if you're making a collection with lots of objects, just tag all the object IDs that went into that collection. You send one purge, and every single object matching that ID is gone. So Imager is one of our customers. They tag every image uploaded um, with the user that uploaded it. And then if a user wants to delete their 5 million images, they send one cache invalidation with that ID, and all those images are gone. So it outsourced the cache dependency to us, basically. Uh, we have instant configuration. It takes about five seconds to deploy config. If you have used Varnish, it's, it's actually based on Varnish. You have access to VCL. When you move your traffic to the edge, you also want to know what's going on. Um, so your CDN should have, and we do, have instant log files. The, uh, one, one of the things I've learned is uh, not keeping log files is extremely powerful because it means that when the government comes and asks for them, you can say, I don't have them, right? It's the only acceptable way of not giving them to them is saying, sorry, we don't have them. And since it's not, our log files, we don't actually store any log files, uh, but we do provide a way for customers to stream them off our servers as fast as possible. Uh, and so we have, you know, you can feed it into your analytics engine that then detects bad actors and then uses the API to block edge traffic at the edge, you know, in a 15 second loop. Um, it's really powerful. And we also provide real time stats. So you can kind of see um, an example here. This is actually the mislatency that we see to origin. This was a bad, con this was actually a bad code push from one of our customers and then sent us this. So they could immediately see that their response rates, response times started to go bad. So it's basically a programmatic edge, right? It replaces your firewall, your load balancer, um, and uh, really gives you a tremendous amount of power to work around problems, to diagnose problems, and to accelerate things from the edge. Um, so for example, like, we have plenty of customers who use us to load balance between different cloud providers. Or they will do like, a, they are migrating from one, they'll do like a request to S3. If the object isn't there, they will retry it to Azure. Like, it's a very, very common use case. So thinking, like trying to think about how you would do, do, do uh, architecturally if you had that kind of power at the edge. So I was at a customer a while ago, and they actually, a couple of weeks ago, and they, they demoed this really cool thing to me. So they're currently migrating to a new architecture. They want to be able to have services all around the world. Um, they're a global newspaper with local editions. And uh, the way they do it is this. Uh, client comes to Fastly. Fastly goes through authentication service, which, because they're a paywall, um, the authentication service responds to us. They annotate the request um, with headers. Uh, and they restart the request, and they forward it to their segmentation service, which does the A-B testing and all, all the aspects around tracking. Segmentation service then responds to Fastly. And we get the response. They annotate it even more. And then they restart and actually go to the service that the user requested. And that's where they have services on, on uh, Google, they have services on AWS, they have some in their own data centers, um, they have some third-party services, and then the response goes back to Fastly and back to the client. 
Now, what's really cool with this architecture, uh, from my point of view, is, is two. One, the requests from the authentication service and the segmentation service are cacheable. Two, they don't actually allow their services to talk to each other except via um, the front end bus. So because they want to be able to move them uh, between different providers and not have uh, dependencies between them. So the API service literally relies only on headers that are signed, given out by the, the other services to actually know what to do for this user. The other cool thing is because this is cached, the, these two authentication service and segmentation service responses are cached, the next time the user comes, you don't even go, need to go to those services. Like, you just go directly to the service you want. And if that service is cacheable as well, which it would be if it was a news article, you don't actually have to go back to origin. Right? So you can really uh, build pretty complicated and really, really fast systems. Now, you say, well, I want to revoke user access. Well, you just send a surrogate key purge for the user. Next time it comes through, it will say, I don't know who this is. It will ask the authentication server. The authentication server returns a denied, and the request is denied, and then you can cache that. And so you've now offloaded your, your internal services tremendously and given the user a significantly better uh, experience. Running a CDN is, a, is, is pretty interesting. Um, it, it's easy from a conceptual level. Uh, if you look at the fallacies of distributed systems, we hit all of them really bad, right? Network is not, the internet is not reliable. It's actually pretty fucking terrible. Um, latency is really bad. Uh, bandwidth is not infinite. Um, Netflix uh, launched in New Zealand a little while ago and immediately all bandwidth in New Zealand disappeared and you were getting like two kilobytes per second. Um, the network is definitely not secure uh, and there's many, many administrators. So that's what we deal with, right? And there's very little off-the-shelf software that works. Most of the distributed system software out there uh, uh, assumes a um, couple of servers, a couple of data centers that are fairly close by to each other and that you have reliable links bef between. As I said earlier, our servers are pretty powerful, so we also want to be able to scale up as part as wide. But the core tech we use is all open source, right? We use HAProxy, uh, H2O. Uh, H2O is pretty new. It's written by, by, by a guy in Japan. Uh, it's an extremely fast HTTP 1 and HTTP 2 server, uh, and it's really, really good code. I'm, I'm really excited about it. Uh, Varnish, Bird, Not, and uh, based on Ubuntu. And most of the code on the forwarding plane, data plane is C, most of the control code is Ruby Go, and most of the API uh, front side is Ruby. Networking. So I absolutely hate uh, every single piece of custom built hardware I've ever used, right? So I think F5 should die. I think Cisco should stop making shit. And I think all firewalls are useless, basically, because they're the first thing to die in an attack, because they're so constrained. So what we did is we, we bought switches that run Linux. So if, if you ever dealt with a switch, you know they're pretty horrible from an operating point of view. When I risk that you literally type bash, and you have a bash, bash it, and then you do yum install, and you have like a package installed on it. So we wrote our own code to run the Aristas to do what traditionally these big iron hardwares uh, do. And then we've done a lot of work uh, on coordination technologies. We gave a talk uh, a while ago and published some papers uh, on bimodal multicast, which is how all the POPs talk to each other. So it's a combination of uh, a broadcasting uh, multicast and a gossip protocol for recovery uh, that works around all split brain situations. Uh, and that's what it is. We also rely heavily on the CDN for our own configuration pushes, our own deployments, uh, and our own management. Uh, and then uh, we, we do use the cloud, we use Google and AWS for everything that's not actually forwarding HTTP requests. So if you want to, you can just build your own. It's pretty easy. Install Varnish on a bunch of AWS machines, and then uh, use Route 53 to send traffic to the closest user. Uh, ideally, we should do a better job than, and you shouldn't have to worry about it. Uh, but you should use something for your HTTP requests. Thank you. So we have a few questions. Um, so question one, um, how do you deal with HTTPS? Um, painfully. <laughs> Um, 
we use so we use HA proxy. We have lots of certificates. Uh, we have lots of private keys, and we have automated systems for deploying them. Uh, and then, but I don't know what the real meat of the question is, though. Well, I guess since the entire world is moving to HTTPS, this must be a real hurdle for you guys, right? It is a real hurdle um, for handling. Um, though there are things we have done that make it much better, and there's been quite a lot of articles by other people about it. So, for example, one thing we do is we do a keep alive to the browser for 10 minutes. So, and browsers will actually keep connections open to a web server for five minutes, even after you start surfing away from the site. And like that cut the handshakes by like 35%, I think. So we've done a lot of work around that. But it, so the problems you see are mainly around speed. It's about, it's about handshake, and it's about CPU usage, and it's about uh, how it behaves on the packet loss. OK. Uh, what do you think about the recent developments in peer-to-peer -peer CDNs? Uh, I'm, I, I don't actually know. I haven't spent uh, much time looking at it. OK. So. Good. So uh, you made it quite clear that invalidating caches, uh, it's quite easy, but it's no also known to be one of the two hardest things in computer science, right? Naming things and cache invalidation. Yep. Um, do you have a lot of problems with customers needing support for that kind of thing? Uh, we do. I think one of the more fun ones was this was a large newspaper kept telling us that our purge was broken. <laughs> and uh, it took like two months of this intermittent problem until they basically apologized and bought us a little beer because they were sending the cache invalidation before they committed the change to the database. And we came back so fast that we got the old version. Right? And so that happens fairly often. Uh, and people are like invalidating things they don't know and so on. Um, but yeah, it is a hard problem. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care.